This talk is about the issue of is the whole brain emulation feasible? Or in more particular, what are the constraints of the feasibility of emulating brains? So the idea of uh, the whole brain emulation is to take uh, the biological brain and turn it into a software simulation that encompasses all the relevant properties. This is a kind of at least a conceptual shortcut of how to create software intelligence by taking real intelligence from animals or humans and creating software simulacra that exhibits the same kind of behavior. The interesting question is, of course, uh, can this be done? How easy would it be to do? What would the consequences be? And can we say something right now, since this is obviously a long-term technology that uh, is not going to happen anytime soon, say anything useful about whether this might be feasible or that it might be infeasible for some certain reasons that means that we should put our efforts into something else. So what is a simulation? A simulation consists of taking a domain in the real world uh, and uh, creating a usually simplified simulation in a computer where everything in the real domain has uh, at least some counter. Of course, this might simplify things, taking whole groups of objects in the real world and uh, chunking them together in the simulation. For example, um, a weather simulation would take the, the actual state of atmosphere and simplify that to uh, the average temperature and volume and pressure and wind velocity in different chunks of the simulated atmosphere. We have update rules that uh, update the simulated uh, atmosphere, which hopefully re uh, reflect what is going on inside the real atmosphere. The interesting problem uh, about this is, of course, that if it is to be a simulation that tells us something useful, there has to be a pretty close correspondence between what's going on in the simulation and uh, in the real system. An erroneous simulation will produce a different weather from uh, what we're seeing. And this might be an error of two kinds. It might be that it doesn't produce a weather at all. We might suddenly get no wind at all or that uh, the temperature rises uh, to hundreds of degrees. In which case we would say that uh, simulation is missing out completely. Or it might just predict that it's going to rain tomorrow when it's not going to rain. Which is mainly a uh, matter that we haven't gotten the right data into it. We might also imagine more and more detailed simulations running on finer and finer resolution. Which leads to the interesting concept of emulation. To the left is my first uh, home computer. A Sinclair ZX81 computer. One kilobyte of memory, 44 times 63 in, uh, pixels resolution in black and white on the television. It's a very nice computer, but the physical instance of it is located in my cellar. So when I want to play around with it in my office on my modern computer, I instead run emulation software. This software tries uh, to imitate what is, what's going on inside a, a, a real computer. It has uh, software that simulates the processor, the state of the memory, and uh, implements this, of course, in a very, very different manner from what was actually going on in the electronics of the original computer, but producing the same logical behavior. If I press one of the simulated keys here, uh, I get a uh, response and change of the state of the emulated system that corresponds uh, to what I would have seen if I had been using a real computer. It doesn't uh, simulate the electromagnetical interactions. It just makes use of the fact that in a digital computer we can ignore the low-level uh, structure most of the time. There is an interesting feature that allows me to crash the computer by accident, uh, just like if I bump the table, because of some uh, mechanical instabilities in the electronics, which uh, among aficionados uh, have uh, were decided to be so characteristic that we wanted to have them in the simulation. But most of the time we have an abstraction uh, separation here. Now, we can get a perfect simulation of uh, any simple piece of software running on this computer by running it on emulation. Although the emulation itself works very, very differently from the physical computer, all of the logic of the software above is identical. So a brain emulation would be aiming at uh, indeed achieving something like this. At some deep level, at some fine resolution, we create a system that works different from our brain, but all the uh, levels above that behave indeed uh, like the real brain or sufficiently close, as in the weather example, that, uh, that we get the same characteristic behavior. How could we go about doing this? Well, here's a sketch based on a white paper and uh, I formulated based on a workshop we had in Oxford a few years back. 
We start with a brain which is fixated you know, by freezing it or putting it into plastic. It might be sliced into very, very fine uh, voxels, which are then individually sliced even further, scanned by an electron microscope. We get the local databases. It's probably going to be required a whole factory floor full of these automated systems, but produce enormous amounts of photographic data about where the cell membranes are, which synapses are where, their chemical state, and so on. These ones are put together by a computer vision algorithm into small voxels that uh, contain a map of what's where. These uh, voxels are then uh, distilled into a, a larger computational model encompassing the whole brain, where uh, an axon running across the brain would be put together from the individual voxels in the different parts of the brain. This computational model then is run on a suitably large supercomputer. And uh, not just a uh, simulation of the brain, but probably some adequate environment and body model. And if everything works, we should be getting behavior out of that. That would, in some sense, correspond to the other behavior we would originally expect from the normal brain. The methods of this are, of course, complicated. This is, for example, an example of state of art of using something called a knife edge scanning microtome, which was developed by uh, Bruce McCormick at uh, Texas AMM. So in this case, there are a few Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, uh, which the, the microtome can slice up a mouse brain and turn it into about two terabytes of data, which is already hard to visualize because it's an enormous amount of uh, data, but it's still not enough resolution to accurately uh, figure out what's connected to what in the brain. A real brain emulation would have to be much more powerful. So what are the, the, the constraints we can see on the feasibility of this ever happening? Well, first we have the philosophical issues, the foundational issues about the whole practice. So, we have physicalism. Is actually minds uh, dependent on bread, or in what particular way? Uh, can we get uh, a good definition of what we're aiming for, so that as we try to develop this technology, we actually can see whether we're converging on our goal, and how quickly we're converting, or whether we're just going to be trying in blind to do something. Can we emulate or simulate uh, chaotic systems, or do we invariably diverge from reality too much? And do we need to understand everything about the brain in order to do it? The physicalism uh, issue, I'm not going to spend much time on. It's an enormous area of the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of artificial intelligence in what uh, respect a functional system can implement the mind. Uh, we might even leave out the concept of mind and just say we're interested in brain emulations that can actually achieve certain things. If I take a lawyer brain and scan it, I would ideally want to have a piece of software in there that could also do in a legal uh, practice. Uh, in that case, it might not matter whether that software was conscious or not, just whether the behavior would be uh, the same. And it seems like brain emulation essentially has exactly the same uh, assumptions as uh, most strong AI. Uh, with the interesting addition that uh, everything important in the brain uh, that is needed to figure out must also be measurable. However, it's very hard to tell from the start whether this uh, is anything we can uh, detect outside. So the conceptual arguments about whether uh, strong AI is possible or not might have some bearing here. The problem with defining uh, the correct success criteria uh, is that uh, it might not be possible uh, to test whether it's a, a valid criteria in the first place. We can imagine, for example, wanting to have a complete uh, list of all relevant uh, parts of a brain. However, we don't know from the start whether uh, that is a uh, relevant uh, list of parts because we haven't been able to run an emulation. So just having a perfect brain database is not going to uh, be a, a very useful uh, thing because we can't tell whether it's complete. On the other hand, we might be able to run a, a simulation uh, with uh, the microdynamics and see, does this produce brain-like behavior? For example, large-scale uh, uh, computational neuroscience simulations of cerebral cortex show emergent properties very similar to normal uh, brainwave activity. Without having us deliberately program it in, we uh, do not just get gamma wave activity, but even alpha wave activity. And that seems to suggest that at least some aspects of the connectivity and uh, the microdynamics are correct. We might imagine taking an early brain emulation attempt and not getting any behavior out of it, but at least uh, the states in the brain that are similar to what we would expect from a brain in a uh, maybe disconnected state.
And this might be detectable, of course, given that we have uh, enough data for real brains. We might recognize brainwave activity, so we can at least compare them. The interesting thing is, as soon as you get to a more generic level, that you might actually have a, a brain that shows some behavior, we can start comparing that with the original behavior, or even the species we took the brain from, or even the individual that the brain represents. We could imagine, for example, training a mouse to run a certain labyrinth in a certain way, and then scanning the, the brain, running a mouse simulation, and checking whether the emulated mouse now uh, does uh, run in the labyrinth in the same way. This is actually testable and actually an application of the Turing test that might be useful. Quite often the Turing test is regarded as problematic for testing true intelligence, but insofar as testing whether something is behaviorally similar to an individual mind that we have some data on, it might actually be really pretty useful. However, the more profound questions about could we get a continuation of identity or would the, this simulated mouse actually have inner state, we cannot test and it's essentially the normal problem of other minds and personal identity. So they seem to be completely beyond what we can check. However, these low level of functional issues seem to be possible to uh, test and indeed uh, possible to compare different approaches and see which one produces the best results. Another problem is that the brain is most certainly chaotic. If you connect three uh, neurons together, it's very easy to demonstrate that typically you did get a strange attractor dynamics. And the brain has a hundred billion neurons, which most certainly has potential for much more. In fact, if you calculate the Lyapunov exponents of the uh, uh, electroencephalogram, you can estimate that the divergence, even if you change just a single neuron in terms of behavior, uh, would uh, be about one uh, second. It's very rapidly that this very high dimensional chaotic system could produce different outcomes. So this would seem to suggest that an emulation would, by necessity, since it's not going to be perfect, uh, uh, produce a different behavior from the original system. So one might argue that this means we cannot actually do a proper emulation of an individual brain. However, this is a bit similar to the issue of weather versus climate. We're not interested in doing an exact prediction of what, what a certain brain would have been doing at a certain point in time. We're interested in getting the right character. We wanted to see in the, something like the climate simulation where we do not care really whether it's going to be raining in Oxfordshire in 2100 or not, but rather how much. We want the, 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 to know how the character behaves rather than the individual dynamics. And this is a bit similar like recognizing somebody's voice. Each individual utterance that everybody does are different, but we do recognize the general characteristics. Of course, determining the whether these characteristics are sufficiently identical is going to always be a fuzzy problem, and again gets back to the success criteria problem. The interesting uh, philosophical issue about brain emulation, which sets it apart from most uh, approaches in the conventional neuroscience and indeed in artificial intelligence, is that we're not interested in understanding the brain on a high level. The assumption underlying brain emulation is that we do not need an understanding of intelligence, emotion, and consciousness, but just enough understanding to put together the parts in the right way. So we might imagine somebody with the right uh, tools and instruction being able to put together a car from all the parts. Although uh, they might have no clue what these, these individual parts are, uh, they could be uh, able to put it together into a functioning car. This is a bit different from normal reverse engineering and technology, where you need to understand the system in order to make a copy that behaves in the same way. In this case, it's just taking all the parts and putting them together. And just like uh, it might be useful to know a bit about carpentry when putting together an IKEA furniture, and it would be useful to know more about how the brain functions, because that would help us uh, guide us in putting together the functioning simulation. But it might not be necessary. So this, is, this non organicism is a very different approach uh, that is happening in brain evolution. And it's also uh, assuming that we can trade off brute force and uh, find a resolution of our simulation for the need of understanding high level functions. In classical artificial intelligence, instead, the assumption is that if we understand intelligence at a high level, in that case, we don't need to care about brains, we can just implement the high level system. From a scientific perspective, there are other important uh, issues here. So what level of detail do we need to scan the brain on? Can we separate the dynamics on different scales to make it feasible? Is the brain even a computable system? I'm not going to get into this one because we have been, uh, I 
leads a bit uh, further away, but uh, from at least from the orthodox neuroscience perspective, there is no evidence that the brain is engaged in uncomputable processes. Some people disagree and claim that there are quantum uh, level processes that matter. Uh, and, well, it's been kind of, kind of an ongoing debate between the neuroscientists and physicists. How much of the rest of the body do we need to simulate? And can we guess at how much we need to simulate? So in general, the brain can be studied on many different levels of detail. And these have different characteristic size scales and different characteristic uh, time scales. And if we uh, simulate the brain as composed of neurons, we need to uh, keep track of uh, structures on the scale of at least hundreds of micrometers, actually smaller scales because we have a lot of very fine branches linking to each other, and the dynamics, which is on the order of micros, the milliseconds. Um, on the other hand, if we were to run a molecular simulation, we would need to uh, do stuff down on the nanometer scale or below, and we would uh, need much faster updates. The, we can make a uh, kind of model of the different levels of detail we could be using. This is probably harder to uh, read from the audience, but we can go all the way from the idea that the brain can be represented as computational modules, where each module is very complex, down uh, to the neural network where we simulate the electrophysiology, down to various levels of chemical uh, com uh, complexity, down to the behavior of individual atoms. We know the dynamics of atoms fairly well. If we had some magical uh, uh, you know, source of data about the position and movement of all atoms in the brain and enough computing power, it would be relatively simple to run it. We don't need to understand very much about individual atoms for that. On the other hand, the amount of computing power, power that might be needed to run a high-level model would be much lower. But sadly, uh, we uh, have no good idea about how to get that kind of data. So the low-level systems, they require enormous computing power and very fine resolution scanning. The top-level ones, they require a deep understanding, but not so much computing power. The interesting problem here is, is there a separation of scales? In the air in this room, for example, the collisions between molecules produce uh, the, uh, the various interactions which average out. So on the top level, we can describe the air quite well in terms of pressure, volume, and, in, uh, and its temperature. These are macro level properties which are a result of averaging out the, the low level uh, issues. So this is scale separation and it allows uh, statistical mechanics to function very well. However, in a turbulent fluid, uh, we have various eddies which interact with each other, producing smaller eddies, which in turn interact and produce ever smaller eddies. But the small eddies also interact with bigger eddies in various ways. So different size scales and time scales are interacting with each other. And if we leave out the interaction on a small scale, the interaction on a large scale actually becomes wrong. There is no clear scale separation, which is why it's very hard to run a uh, hydrodynamic model that encompasses turbulence. If the brain is everything like turbulence, in that case we have a big, big problem. And I think this is the main point of my talk. I think this is actually something that can be empirically investigated, has interesting implications for a philosopher mind, and might tell something useful in the here and now about the eventual feasibility or infeasibility of brain animation. Do we have a reason to think that there are various levels of scale separation in the brain, or that it actually forms a form of a giant turbulent hole? Well, there is an interesting experiment uh, by Howling and Brain, where they trained rats to recognize stimulation of a single neuron in their brains. So if the neuron was uh, stimulated, the rat was supposed to lick, uh, and then it got a little bit of juice as a reward. And it turns out that you can get a behaviorally meaningful result from this, but you can actually get a brain that is sensitive to the behavior of a single neuron. That means that we cannot uh, assume we can just average out populations of neurons. At least for sp special cases like this, we do not have scale separation from the neural level upwards. There are also interesting uh, examples where we have uh, our ability to detect the direction of sound, which are dependent uh, on uh, uh, individual impulses reaching a neuron's soma in the, in the auditory nuclei down in the brainstem at slightly different uh, times. A simulation leaving out this uh, level of detail would not be able to de detect whether a sound is coming from left or right, which is obviously quite important for some behavioral uh, uh, activities. So it seems like we would probably need to have at least down to the cellular level. I do not know whether one could uh, repeat this experiment on a synaptic scale. It might very well be that at that level it does average out. 
On the other hand, we also know that the numbers of ions that are entering and leaving a um, cell when it having an actual potential is fairly large compared to the noise level. So in a synaptic spike, about 600 calcium ions enters it and affects uh, the, the memory formation. This is a very small number, 600 atoms. However, it's still rather large to the, the square root over n uh, the variance you get from this. So it's a fairly reliable process. So this might be actually where the law of mass action is standing. However, the critics might argue that the number of proteins inside a synaptic spine might be so low. Each individual protein might be represented by so few instances that we might see deviations here. But overall, synapses seem to be fairly reliable in the systems. And the, the, the individual variation does tend to get out. I think we have a reason to think that the, on the, this level, the molecular level just below the action potential, we might see scale separation. Uh, this is an illustration from Christoph Koch's Biophysics of Computation, where he looks at the, the information process in the single neurons. And uh, here he has uh, on this uh, direction the time scale of various interactions, and this is the spatial scale. It's interesting to notice that among all these different computational processes he describes, there is actually a separation between uh, the molecular flip-flops uh, going on the spines and the rest. This is, again, very loose evidence because it might turn out tomorrow that we discover various processes in this region. But this might suggest how we might go about actually looking for a scale separation. However, uh, there are probably very valuable contributions that can be done here from statistical mechanics and uh, the theory of dynamical systems. The brain-centeredness, I don't have time to get into it too deeply, but basically, how much of a body do we need? And we know that minds are possible even in profoundly disabled uh, uh, people who can't move. They still have a mental life, they still function. It's just that the body is not adequate for most purposes. Uh, it seems like a body simulation can probably be relatively simple, at least compared to uh, the, the brain simulation. And similarly, the environmental simulation even second life is probably enough to at least test whether something is pro uh, having intelligence, uh, although it might not be particularly nice to live in it. It seems that the total amount of computational power needed for a body and uh, environment simulation is actually pretty small compared to a fine grade um, simulation of a brain. Another problem is, of course, we might be forced to simulate more modalities of the nervous system than just neural firing. Uh, so there are a number of known unknowns, for example, the, the different kinds of neurotypes and different kinds of uh, metabolites and neurotransmitters. This can be estimated in various ways, and although these estimation methods are very uncertain, very, uh, they're definitely a finite number. Then there are various more exotic possibilities, like that we need to deal with the spinal cord, which is quite possible and would expand the, the, the simulation by a few percent. As we go downwards, we get to do more messy things like the haptic effects, which would be electromagnetic interactions between action potential running parallel, which are in theory possible. There are some simulations. Nobody is really convinced they're really important, except for a few researchers. But if they turn out to be important, we would need to add an electromagnetic model to the computation, which would make it bigger and harder to run, but uh, definitely not infeasible. The real uh, showstoppers would probably be if we, the brain was using analog computation, that it actually matters quite a lot to different uh, states. However, this is unlikely due to the thermal and other sources of noise. But if we're somehow making use of true randomness, this is an objection often mentioned that you cannot run a brain on a deterministic system. However, it would seem that one could object that taking true randomness, recording it in a sufficiently long string, and then playing it up would do exactly the same job. So it's very unclear whether we could, whether it's any bearing on that. If it actually turns out that Penrose, Hammerhoff, and others are right, that quantum competition is going on, then we would at the very least need the quantum hardware. And probably we couldn't do the brain scanning simply because we need to get quantum states. On the other hand, dynamical states most certainly is uh, unlikely to be uh, relevant. So that would be that the current electrical state of my brain would be needed to record in order to make an emulation of it. However, we know that people who nearly drowned in cold lakes have survived the, the experience, become uh, woken up and uh, normal, but the, due to the low temperature, they had no brain activity. Since neurons stop firing when the body temperature goes below 26 degrees Celsius. So we can be fairly certain that the dynamical state uh, is not uh, the problem. However, the, Big issues, of course, are unknown unknowns. So if you're a skeptic, you can always 
of course, guess that there might be an unknown unknown here, which is going to derail the process. But that's not something we can do any sensible assessment of. Finally, we have technological issues. It might be, as I have said, that there might be foundational problems that the components require extremely complex computations, which are hard to do. However, we know that uh, 1.4 kilogram of biological matter can definitely do it, so we know there are physical systems that can implement them. However, it might turn out that some of these computations are hard to run on our kind of computers. It might be that in the specialized hardware, or that that hardware is not available due to economic or technological constraints. Similarly, we need scanning methods, which are realizable. If we would need to get the position of every atom in the brain, we would be unlikely to be able to do that because uh, of quantum mechanical and other the thermal noise uh, problems. And there might also be ethical limitations of the scanning methods. If certain scanning methods were ex extremely painful, it might not just be a problem of doing it to human candidates, but even on test animals. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but overall, if one fits logistic curves to Moore's law, it seems like the, uh, the range of uh, eventual computing power that's going to be available in the long run is going to be very, very extreme. It's, uh, in this model, I get a 99% probability that it's at least uh, uh, 100,000 times more computing power per dollar. And that's the lowest level. This is an exponential uh, scale, so we get about 20 orders of magnitude of uncertainty. There seems to be room for a ridiculous amount of computing power in the future. We can plug that in, and again, I'm sorry you can't read this, but it's in my white paper. Uh, we can estimate what the level might nature force us to work on and how much computing power does that take. And that allows us to make some rough estimates of when the first might be possible. However, to conclude, I think scale separation represents a very useful uh, wedge to actually investigate where, whether the brain emulation is possible or not. Thank you.